Hello and welcome to Whale Hunting, where every week we shine light onto the hidden worlds of money and power. This week we have a very special guest, Saad Mosini, the CEO of Moby Group and the author of a new book coming out later this month called Radio Free Afghanistan. The book tells the story about he and his brothers who had been born in Afghanistan but lived abroad most of their lives, returning to Kabul in 2001 after the fall of the Taliban. And looking for something to do, they hit on the idea of creating a new media company, which ended up becoming the most important media company in Afghanistan. And they saw everything, including the, the, the climactic uh, return of the Taliban in 2022. It's an absolutely fascinating book. So welcome, Saad. Thank you. So you have this new book coming out, Radio Free Afghanistan. It's all about your career showing up in Afghanistan as a, I guess, young Afghan Australian trying to make a business, right? You, you didn't start off with media at the front of your mind. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, it's, it was an accidental business. Uh, I keep telling people, and of course I've written about it, but uh, we went back um, wanting to do something, uh, not quite sure what we could do. Well, the idea was that we did, let's create like a fund of sorts and we'd invest in different ventures. Uh, media came up quite by accident, and, um, and our assumption was that we'd appoint a manager and let the business develop. But it was so controversial, and um, and it just, I mean, it really dragged us all in, uh, kicking and screaming. I mean, I literally had to travel back and run the operation from the get-go. Uh, because media is always controversial, especially in a place like Afghanistan. Yeah, I would imagine that you probably were thinking of it as a business, but you didn't realize that it would put you in the room with all of the political figures, all of the, you know, Americans that were in Afghanistan, all the journalists. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that was something you'd never even had in your mind, that it would sort of put you at the center of this quite pivotal global geosecurity situation in a way. Yeah, I mean, even as a business, I wasn't quite sure because we thought, well, if we can generate, you know, you know, $20,000 a month, it'll break even. Um, but we were mentally struggling with like, you know, how can we generate that much money? And the best we could come up with was in those days, like $2,000 a month. Right? So even from a commercial perspective, it seemed daunting. So it was a bit of a gamble. Um, and I was a banker and I was, you know, earning good money. And my brothers were also quite successful. So for us, there was also a huge opportunity cost to move to Afghanistan. But it was fun. But I guess maybe it's the sense of adventure, the sense of being, you know, back in your ancestral country. That that was probably was a big factor, right? Absolutely. And I think it was wonderful to be there in those early days. Everything seemed possible. And the place was new, yet so familiar, you know, being Afghan and all. Um, and uh, it, was, it was great to be there. And I, I, I cannot describe how it felt in those early years. Yeah, I can actually, there was a passage in your book where you described how when you fly into Afghanistan, you might be distracted with a book until you hit Afghan mm -hmm. airspace, and then you sort of perk up, you know, look out the window, there's like this energy that you feel. And I haven't spent anywhere that much time in Afghanistan, but I had the same feeling actually arriving that I looked out the window and I felt like I was going somewhere special, you know? Yeah. So, and, and also just looking at it from above is also just an extraordinary experience. I mean, it's mountain after mountain after mountain. And if you go back to Alexander the Great uh, and more recently the Americans, you can see why it's such a challenging country to conquer. But, but there's also something wonderful about the place. I mean, in, in the book I quote John Lee Anderson. I asked him, I said, John Lee, I mean, what's so special about Afghanistan? And he thought about it. He said, the sky seems so high. And... Um, it's uh, initially I thought, well, that's a strange statement, but over time, I understand what he means. You sort of feel free because it's a high altitude place. The skies are blue usually, the mountains and the people. It's a compelling place. Yeah, and I guess also, the time that you were there, it's such a confluence of world powers. I mean, you know, on one hand, you might be focusing on like a domestic program for, at, at Tolo, but the same day you're meeting with a general or the prime minister. I mean, there's something about being at that at that moment, you know? Well, it had its moment. It was at the center of the universe for a period. You're right. I mean, you know, all sorts of strange people used to show up and we had to interview them from ministers to VIPs to actors, um, you know, Hollywood stars. 
Um, yeah, they were interesting, interesting years. But I, I think for Afghans also it was interesting because you always you, you were sort of starting from scratch. If you had, you know, if you have an opportunity to start from scratch, uh, a country, uh, its system, its bureaucracy. I mean, it was an enormous opportunity for the country. Much of it was squandered, as we found out. But in the early years, everything everything seemed possible. Um, what was the moment? So you had this kind of startup, media startup. Like you said, the business was not an obvious yes in terms of you know monthly revenues. What was the moment when you and your brothers and sister kind of said, you know what, are we going to keep doing this? Was there was there kind of a, a point where you were really strained that you thought this wasn't a good idea? No, I think we always felt um, soon after launching, we realized that the, the venture had legs. Uh, but we never had a moment to sort of savor uh, its success because as soon as it was successful in Kabul, we expanded beyond the city of Kabul. Uh, and then we went into television. We went into a second television station network. Then we expanded overseas. So we never had that moment of, well, let's sit back and you know put our feet on the table and relax for a second. We were constantly evolving and developing the business. Um, and, you know, that's why time has gone so quickly, because, you're, you know, we were so busy. My brother Zaid used to have a saying that, you know, always bite more than you can chew and then chew like crazy. And that pretty much was our mantra for, for a long, long time. I like that. That's a good, that's a good business mantra. Yeah. <laughs> and what about, um, what, what, was, what was the moment when it felt like this was a really meaningful thing? I mean, what were some of the pivotal journalistic moments or even just entertainment moments? Well, I thought that, um, you know, uh, speaking truth to power, I thought was very important. But in practice, it's always more challenging. So when we hired all these journalists, these young journalists, many of them without any experience in journalism, uh, we tried to empower them and say, hey, these are your stories, run with them. And there was a lot of hesitancy initially, but I think when we realized that these guys could go out and put stories on their own, and then we would air those stories without challenging them, I think there was a moment that we felt that, you know, the training wheels are off and they can do this on their own. Um, and that, that was an important moment for us because then it became the standard for us in terms of pushing the envelope on issues, both cultural and news-wise. So you're, you're running this business with your family it's it's all all in, all consuming. At the same time, Afghanistan is going through these this roller coaster ride over twenty years. I mean, so many times things go forwards and backwards, and maybe even eventually mostly backwards. But what was that experience like? Witnessing it in the context of running this media business. I mean, did you have a strong sense that people were making a lot of mistakes? In leadership positions from the from the get go, I mean, did you did you have a sense that things are going in the right direction at any point? Yeah, it became obvious that mistakes were being made, and um, I remember this conversation um, with the president. We we had interviewed some Taliban members in the south, uh, which I've mentioned in the book. Uh, that resulted in the arrest of my brother and three of our employees. And I literally had to go to the presidential palace to negotiate with the president. And, um, and he said, why are you uh, amplifying these messages from the Taliban? And I said, well, their grievances are real, and I think you have to address them. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, they're instruments of foreign powers, and they're being manipulated. And I said, but they have local grievances. You know, there's the predatory behavior of local officials. It's not uh, serving these communities. It's having the most, you know, corrupt officials in charge. And I think the, there was this realization, this is early on, 2005, 2006, that they didn't quite get what governing uh, means. And, um, and governance is such an important issue. I mean, there's an old adage that, you know, oppositions don't win, it's governments that lose. But that's also the case in terms of insurgency. It's, it's what you do wrong that allows insurgents to prosper. So... It was early on, and, I, and it was very frustrating because it was like watching a, you know, an accident in slow motion. And it happened over much slower, of course, and, you know, there was no need, we felt there was no need to panic and that the system will self-correct. But, um, but it was apparent early on that the foundations of the state were actually pretty fragile. 
What what about from the point of view of like the the generals and even the NGOs? Did anybody understand this kind of core concept you're saying, which is, listen, there's no future of Afghanistan where you stamp out a certain entity, the Taliban. Hmm. Like they can't be stamped out through force. But it seems like nobody ever really grasped that concept. Well, I mean, firstly, I don't think you can kill an idea. But what you can do is come up with a better idea. And I think that better idea never never really was developed fully. The other thing, of course, is you have to win them over. And if they have their, they have certain grievances and people, you know, uh, local grievances, for example, you address them. And I think that they failed on both fronts. And there was this hubris and arrogance that we can, we have the mightiest power behind us. We have trillions of, you know, certainly hundreds of billions of dollars that we can, that we will eventually prevail. And they may have prevailed if they had been there in the country for a hundred years. But we all knew that the Americans in those days, I mean, you looked at Vietnam, it wasn't that long. And as a matter of fact, Afghanistan became America's longest war. But even then, they eventually had enough and they left. So I think there was certainly arrogance from the Afghan side and laziness, not wanting to address major issues. But there was also a certain naivete from the international side. The political side of it as well, just how do you have give somebody a voice who has such a different point of view about how things should be done in the country, right? Absolutely. So tell me where you were during the U.S. withdrawal. What were you? Where were you based? What were you seeing? What were you imagining was going to happen? I flew into Kabul late July. I saw the president, realized that like he was had deluded himself into believing that he was going to survive somehow because the country was falling apart. I flew out. I was in Europe when uh, when his government collapsed. And then this is in mid-August. Um, and then I think I flew to Dubai. Uh, and by the time I got to Dubai, it was late August. And the Americans withdrew. They completed their withdrawal, I think, on the 31st of August. And what was going inside Tolo during this whole period? I mean, it must have been pretty crazy. It was complete mayhem because, uh, well, initially we felt, always felt the Taliban would be our biggest challenge, but there was actually people leaving. Every single day, you know, 10, 15 individuals, our most important people, would just go to the airport uh, and get one, one of these flights out of Afghanistan. So for us, the biggest challenge was capacity. You know, how do we get new reporters, get new producers? Um, uh, Iqbal Waksapai, who was the head of our news, uh, his thing was, how do I keep this thing going? And that to us was our biggest challenge in those weeks. And what were the staff who were leaving saying? I mean, were they were they sort of apologizing, saying, I don't feel like I can survive here if this happens? Or and what was the kind of the theme of what they were saying? I mean, it was a scary moment. I mean, uh, I could fully understand as to why they wanted to leave. Some of them were quite well known as journalists, of people who had tackled the issue of insurgency and been critical of the Taliban. Um, others were female presenters. They felt that they have no future in Afghanistan. So it's it, 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 it's understandable as to why people faced with a situation such as the one that they faced, and then have the opportunity to get on a flight and get out of Afghanistan would take uh, would go to the airport and attempt to get out with their families. So it was understandable. And some of your journalists put themselves in harm's way during that period, right? Uh, with, with the explosion and, and that sort of thing. So while this was happening, we still had to cover the withdrawal. We still had to cover the terrorist attacks, one in particular when ISIS struck. So, and they had to cover the evacuation of, you know, tens of thousands of Afghans. So the irony is that their colleagues are inside the airport, but then like, other colleagues are covering the story. So it was, a, it was a weird period in that I don't think anyone got any sleep for weeks. I certainly, the, the whole period is sort of a blur but, you know, we also had to help these people. So we had to fill out their forms, uh, P2 forms that allowed them to leave. Many of them had to get COVID tests, uh, get their passports. So we had a team that helped on the admin side. And there were a lot of NGOs that were flying people out. We were not involved in the actual evacuation of people. And at the same time, we had to keep this business alive and deal with the Taliban and their takeover of, 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 over of Afghanistan and cover the day-to-day -day stuff. I mean, it feels in a way like for 20 years you lived this 24-7 experience, just the 
the the the pace of change, the pace of you know drama, and you know now you're finally sitting back working on this book with your with your colleague, and I mean, how does it feel? What's your kind of your bigger feeling about what you experienced over those twenty years? I, I started to write this book because I felt that it may be over for us as a media group inside the country. Um, but writing it has been sort of cathartic because you reflect and you see what you did. And I think what the, the, there's a real not because of us, but there's a realization that Afghanistan changed forever. It's a vastly urbanized country. It's the youngest country outside of sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at younger people, they're like 70 or 80 percent literate today. You know, they even if they're living in smaller towns, they're getting the urban experience. So the country is very different to what it was in 2002. And the hope is that these people will eventually, you know, the gains of the last 20 years that can be sustained because of these younger people. So, um, and I thought, you know, we had to make a strategic decision to stick around, not to leave Afghanistan, not to become this pirate network, uh, because it was important for us to get information to people and also get information out of Afghanistan to the international community. And today we're doing a lot of interesting things, like we're doing television education programs, we're doing programs on women's entrepreneurship, and we're pushing back on a lot of issues, including girls' education, on a daily basis. You know, there's this debate within the country itself in terms of why schools for girls need to reopen. So I think, um, now, of course, there's no music and there are no dramas. Nonetheless, I think our people are doing what they ought to do, which is to hold the authorities to account within within the realm of what they what they can actually achieve i guess if they were to try to do something the way you used to do it it would just get shut down no i think that we're you know we're 95 percent of what we used to we cover every major story there is but sometimes without too much fanfare because of how controversial it is uh, is it so i mean there's a lot of assumptions people make you, you can make an assumption the Taliban are, quote, backwards or, <clears throat> or they're regressive as a, as a political force and, and they're unwilling to change or unwilling to listen. Are you seeing any signs that that is a completely incorrect view of the Taliban, that there is something about them, maybe it's softening around being open to imagining what the future could be like for Afghanistan, it might be different than how it was, for example, when they first took over? Mm -hmm. Well, it's first and foremost, it's not a monolithic movement. Uh, there are different points of view within the movement itself. Uh, the flip side of that is that they're very loyal to the leadership and the instructions or decrees that come from the top. So you may see them privately um, say, we don't agree with this policy, but in practice, they have to toe the official line. I think that's an important thing to, to bear in mind. Nonetheless, because it's such a big movement, there are so many different points of view that you will see eventually um, a pushback of sorts from one or two quarters on a whole range of issues, including girls' education. So I think, I think that's a question of time. You cannot see a political party um, and what is decreed at the very top remain unchallenged. That's never happened anywhere else in the world. So I think that will come over time. The second thing, of course, is that all these Taliban guys are exposed to modern day things like in Kabul and Mazar Sharif or Herat. So you're seeing their conduct change on a day to day basis. They know how to speak to women now. They're polite. They have uniforms. They're becoming more professional. They're learning to how to govern. I think that's an important thing. Um, and what you also pointed, I alluded to in terms of the leadership, some of these leaders are in their 30s of 40s. They understand that for them to be able to survive, Afghanistan needs to be fully engaged with the region, with the world. Um, and especially given how vulnerable Afghanistan is, it needs help in terms of development, humanitarian assistance, and so forth. So they may view what well, let's call it compromise or flexibility as, as necessary in order to survive. So all of these things are playing out. Concern that I have are the, the decrees and the directives and whatever that's coming from the top is actually, they're pretty hardcore. Um, and you, you said regressive. I mean, that's what, the, I mean, Taliban 1.0 is probably not that different to 2.0. What the difference is, 
in, is in terms of implementation of these decrees, that you are not seeing the full implementation of some of these directives. But the question is, for how long? Who will win at? Um, the guys who are unwilling to implement these decrees or the guys who are issuing these decrees? Mm, that's, that's fascinating. Who, who actually, we talked before about how uh, President of Afghanistan was worried about the um, foreign powers meddling and sheltering the Taliban, helping them to you know, continue to persist in their, in their defiance. Who nourishes the Taliban's ideology today? I mean, who is potentially influential over their, their point of view? They're pretty confident. As a matter of fact, when they, um, these directives from the Ministry of Vice and Virtue was, were issued in relation to women and not, you know, women uh, not being allowed to speak out or to sing or to perform um, and for them to cover their faces, the Minister for Vice and Virtue challenged any Islamic scholar um, to a debate. So it's the Taliban versus two billion other Muslims. You know, they're pretty cocky in terms of what they think is, is the right interpretation of Islam. Uh, so in that way, they are self-contained. But I think, listen, I think ultimately the region will have, um, you know, and their advice, as long as it's not didactic or condescending and it's constructive, I think will have an impact. I think the Americans and the Brits and the Europeans can have more of a say, and I've argued for more engagement, not to recognize the Taliban. I think you can engage with them without legitimizing their rule over this country, this complicated country of 40 million people. But I think engagement's important. I think that over time, they will become more pragmatic in their dealings with the world. I had a thought which was, and perhaps it won't have a big impact, but you know, one of the biggest changes in the Middle East that people haven't really uh, explored because they're so focused on other things that are going on is obviously Saudi Arabia, its perspective as a state on Islam has changed tremendously mm. since the rise of MBS. And if I felt like I wondered if the fact is if you go, if you're a Taliban member and you visit Mecca on, on, on Hajj or something, your experience would be very different than it was even 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And I just wondered if perhaps seeing that the consensus, the global Islamic consensus had, has shifting, could it have some influence on them? It's ironic because it was Saudi-funded madrasas in the 80s that radicalized South Asia, uh, namely Afghanistan. Uh, the Saudis can play a very constructive role. The problem is that the Saudis have sort of checked out when it comes to Afghanistan and South Asia. They're focused more on their relationship with the U.S. and domestic priorities like rebuilding the country and rebuilding the Saudi economy. But, uh, but I th I'm, I'm absolutely certain that the Saudis were to engage or re-engage, that uh, they could play a constructive role. I think the Emiratis and the Qataris are playing a constructive role. They have engaged. And they're probably telling them the things that we would tell them in terms of allow girls to go back to school, have better ties with the international community, in particular the Western nations. The Taliban are very receptive to working with the West. They understand the limitations in terms of dealing with China and Russia and so forth. So they're not totally oblivious to these things. But I think the question is, you know, how much time do we have? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It's absolutely fascinating book. It made me realize or think, I want to, I want to explore the history of many different world events through the eyes of a newspaper or a TV station or a radio station, because it's actually something that stays somewhat stationary amidst all the change. You know, you and your family running this this media company is was one of the things that stayed the same throughout this 20-year experience. So I think that's really fascinating. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you. That's it for this week. Thank you for joining us. You can pre-order Radio Free Afghanistan. It comes out later this month in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, also, please follow everything we do at Whale Hunting through our newsletter, which is whalehunting.projectbrazen.com. You'll get our weekly Weekender edition, among other many fun and interesting explorations that we do. Whale Hunting is a production of Project Brazen. It's hosted by me, Tom Wright, and Bradley Hope. It's produced by Megan Dean, Claire Urban, and Arnav Binaikia. At Project Brazen, Mariangel Gonzalez is our project manager, and Charlie Barlow is associate producer. Ryan Ho is the creative director, with additional design from Andrea Claridge.